share their uh, main development system in all the uh, factories and so on. For instance, in paper, yeah. paper manufacturing, Nokia tires, whatever there it was, Nokia cable, and so on. And they sti maybe still exist. Maybe you can tell us more if you wish. If this this evening. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I think because Yuka also worked for Nokia, didn't you? Sometime. Yeah, I think so. But this, this happened over 30 years ago. That's what uh, Jarmo uh, used to say to me every single time. You probably know him or have seen him in the past. I actually met him uh, when we were doing the Open Next World Tour. He was doing a conference for MongoDB, where he's working right now, and we were in the same breakfast uh, place, actually. <laughs> so I said, hey, this is quite impossible that I actually meet you now. So, um, hi. Um, nice to meet you all. Uh, it's your 30th anniversary of the Finnish Vogue, which is always a good event. Uh, my name is Ruben Reuter, I will introduce myself a little bit more uh, in a bit. Um, sorry I wasn't able to join you yesterday and yesterday evening. Uh, I had a long day of travel. Uh, <laughs> it was a very early start for me, let's say 3.30 in the morning or something. I had to get up to get my plane, so uh, it, was, it was a little bit tricky. But uh, I'm here today, so um, all set up and i um, going to tell you something or yeah, uh, talk to you about uh, the migration from, from classic to but first, a little bit about me and some of these people who have been to the Open Edge World Tour event already saw this, but it's not just me because I rely on this very important woman over here, which is my wife, Mati. Mati, yes. But with IE, yeah. And these are our daughters, or at least we call them our daughters. We don't have kids. We live in the beautiful city of Rotterdam. Uh, uh, people, and I was, uh, uh, I was out with some British people last weekend. And they all seem to think is that Amsterdam and the Netherlands are the same thing. Uh, same with Americans. They're like, oh, yes, Amsterdam. No, Rotterdam. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they always think that's a separate country or something. But it's not. You know, it's, it's a small country, I admit. Uh, but there are still 18 million of us living over there. So uh, anyway, a um, little bit more about me. So what do I do in my spare time? What are my hobbies? I play field hockey. Uh, you guys play ice hockey. I play field hockey. Uh, for obvious reasons, we don't have eyes that much anymore. Um, what do I do as well? I, I play some golf as well. And I love my computer games. I love playing board games as well. I love cooking a lot as well. So as you can hear, I have no spare time with all those hobbies. Um, just quick agenda for this session. Uh, just a pedigree recap. And I will ask some questions later on to know what I should or what I shouldn't sell based on the experiences so far. Uh, some of the uh, app server stuff that you need to be aware of, some of the web feed stuff that you need to be aware of when you're moving from A to B, or from classic app server to, to Pezzoe at least. Um, why this session? Obviously because it's the main blocker for most people when moving to open it as well. You know, first we had that 32-bit, 64-bit thingy. We got, that, we got rid of that, so there's really no excuse except for this one right now to make the switch. Uh, it's an important one, uh, but I need to be a little bit cautious uh, who I'm talking to here. So raise your hand if you are not on Pezzoe and not on Open Edge 12. Yeah, just, you know, no, no, I'm not shaming every, anyone here. So it's, it's, it's just a question. I need to be aware of, the, uh, uh, of what people know and what they don't know. So raise your hand if you're on Pezzoe but on Open Edge 11 7. Sub yeah, sub choice. There's a little finger going up in the back. There, there's another one. Yeah, okay, good. And then we're up, we obviously raise your hand if you're already on Open Edge 12 and Pezzo Good stuff. So we have some people here who are already who went through this, and I want to hear your experiences as well because it's very valuable for us as well. Uh, based on whatever we tell, based on what we have in terms of documentation, uh, where are we lacking, uh, etc. But I think it makes sense since we do have people who are still not so knowledgeable about what PESOE is, it's just, you know, walk through it again because I'm just 
call this one understanding the beast because um, I do think it's important that you understand the basics. Um, so again, why? Well, Pezzo is the future. For a very simple reason, you know how that goes. I, I remember it. So I started the progress in 2014, end of 2014. So there was 11.5. What was released with 11.5? Pezzo E. So I was new to the company, uh, not new to Open Edge, uh, as I was working with the application partner before in the Netherlands. Uh, so we were heavily using uh, the application server and web suite uh, in, the, in the company. So uh, yeah, so I never got to make this journey together with them, but they made it themselves. So I will tell them uh, tell a little bit about their story as one of the, let's say, success stories or the people that have at least thought through their process very well before actually doing this and also offering still uh, at some point two versions of their customer saying, okay, you can still use the classic app server 11.7, but you can already start using Pezzoe, or you move to the directly to 12, but then there's only Pezzoe. So mm -hmm. there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff to think of, if you, especially if you look uh, at it from an application partner perspective. So who's working for an application partner? DJ, yeah? So in the rest of them, it, it, it's all working for direct customers? No, I'm concerned. Yeah, okay. So but well, you're, then you're being hired by direct customers, probably. Uh, yeah. And by application partners as well? Yes. So you do a little bit yeah, of everything. Where yeah. it's needed. Exactly. So, but it's, the delivery model is very different, can be very different, I should say, between an application partner and a direct customer, because an application partner needs to do stuff generic for everyone, and they need to build installers, etc., cetera, et cetera, and you can, yeah, with your own environment, you can do whatever you want, right? Uh, so there is no more classic app server in Open Edge 12, importantly. Um, so what I was telling you, I, I can remember still when I was 11.5 and then uh, Rob Straight said, no worries, classic app server is still here to stay. You can all remember that statement probably and there's nothing more swift <laughs> than, the, than, than the product management and, and also with Open Edge. Uh, so I already knew, you know, we're not going to maintain two different solutions for, well, but we still did it for quite some time, you know, if you, we're still doing it with 11.7. Uh, so considering everything's considered, uh, we'll be retiring that one in 2025. So that means that we have supported, well, at least the, the both of them together for, for them for more than 11 years already. Um, and sometimes I'm a little bit scared when I'm thinking of, wow, it's already nine years ago since the thing was released. But it's also a good thing because now I can actually kind of proudly present about it and you know, we have production environments, <coughs> a lot of production environments running on Pezzoe now. But I already started out helping out with migrations in the beginning. And I can tell you a little bit uh, about that later as well, <laughs> which was not that successful for, for other reasons. Um, so 11.7 uh, retires October 2025. There have been some questions raised because there's some uh, mismatch with, I think, the Java uh, retirement of their version, uh, which seems to uh, uh, mismatch. But anyway, that will be uh, uh, still going on. There's a lot of new deployment methods, advanced security and monitoring, uh, which we'll be talking about later on as well. But that is uh, very important in terms of this is what you get out of the box and a lot more than what which you had with the classic app server. That's still the one. Uh, resource usage obviously is one uh, because it's, it's less heavy on resources, but I will uh, mention that uh, in a second as well. Uh, and it's still mentioned as the number one blocker uh, for moving to open it's 12. So having a look at the architecture, uh, um, I don't know, so, so this was Mike's topic, was supposed to be Mike's topic here, uh, but I can tell you a little bit about it, basically what we did. So the whole concept is the web server. It's running on Tomcat. And what do you do on Tomcat? You deploy web applications. So what we did, we created some of the web applications ourselves for maintenance, monitoring, administrative purposes. So you have a thing called the OE Manager uh, web app, which can be used by you guys for monitoring, uh, getting all sorts of information, but also stopping agents, uh, flushing stuff, uh, resetting stuff, uh, refreshing stuff, those kind of things. That's all for you to decide. 
but for example, uh, um, Progress Developer stu Studio uses it as well for some of the tasks that you can do from there. So it, it's really something maintained by us, um, and we'll come back to that maybe in a later session, which is okay. Um, then obviously, that, there's a big change here, right? So what do we see here? So we're talking about web applications, and then we have something called an ABL application, because obviously all of your applications are ABL applications. Um, but still, it is a type of web application, because we can only be called web applications on the top of the What does it mean? So we have sort of a, 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 a the root one, and so if you, if you go to localhost, whatever, uh, uh, 8810, like it states here, then you always end up, if you do not add anything, you end up in the root application. The root application by default, what we deploy, if you choose either the dev uh, or the prod uh, uh, production uh, um, uh, models, and that is something you can do when you create an instance, you say something like padman create, and then you say at some point, dash Z, capital Z, and then you can decide what security model you want to use. Do you want it to be a production instance? Do you want it to be a dev instance, development instance? Or do you want it to be, and that's another flavor that we have, a pass instance? So prod is a little bit different to pass in one aspect, is that by default on the development and production instances, we deploy the OEABL.war. So this is R, again, the progress open action web app, which is capable of running open edge applications, which is capable of compiling code in, in running the AVM within Tomcat, I should say. That is basically what is deployed there. But if you choose the PES one, which is sort of the, the way we want to make sure is that um, there is absolutely no access to the root thing here. Um, so we deploy there, by default we deploy something called no access.war. So if you would go to this URL then, it would just say something like uh, uh, reviews, something uh, something simple, just a very simple string uh, t telling you that the connection is reviewed. Um, then we have the named web apps, and that is usually, you can deploy your app at the root app if you want to, but you can also decide basically to have your own web apps. You could see this as um, isolation levels. So you can talk about instance level configuration, talk about ABL application level configuration, and you can talk about ABL web app configuration. Uh, again, and, and that, what, what the powerful thing about that is, is that it means you can also inherit stuff, you know? So if you define things at the ABL application level, for example, if, let's say two ABL web apps as we call them here, so let's say you have a, a SOBIS page, which is also an ABL web app, and you have, let's say, uh, a, let's say normal applications of transport that we're using for your application. They are both using the same databases, both using the same profiles, so basically everything is the same. So it doesn't make sense then to, to at ABL web app uh, level, already configure stuff like the database connections or the profiles or those kind of things, because if they're using the same thing, why not put it into one ABL application, which makes one place to configure it? It's better. If you look at the instance, and if you compare that to the classic app server, I would call that the broker. So you would have several brokers running right now for different sort of application models, right? So maybe you have a state free broker for REST, maybe you have a stateless broker for application server traffic, maybe you have state aware or state reset uh, kind of uh, uh, session models. And for all those session models, you needed to run these different brokers. And the cool part is you don't need to anymore. You could potentially run all of those within the same instance. But we'll talk about a little bit later on what, 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 why would you decide on doing that or not. Because there's, there's all sorts of reasons why, you would advise, why I would advise in favor of against it. Uh, based on, could be a number of things, but we'll come back to that in a bit. So then we have, so traditionally in the classic app server, we had that broker, right? So the application server broker would spawn agents. And an agent basically would be able to run uh, the AVM and handle one ABL session at a time. As you can see, it's a little bit different here. We've got, we've got a thing here called multi-session AVM agents. 
And why I keep, do I keep on repeating this? Because it's, it's very important if you want to understand why it behaves like it behaves. Uh, because a lot of people sometimes come, okay, but I've been trying this and it used to work, but now it's not working anymore. And then I'm all, always trying to explain, okay, but you're dealing with <coughs> something else here. So what is happening here, we made it threaded, right? So basically that means is that the session manager in this, in this case is basically saying, okay, so whatever comes in here, and we're always connecting over HTTP. So what does that mean? Every HTTP connection enters an HTTP session. And the HTTP session at some point needs to be linked to an ABM session over here. So the session manager is responsible of doing that. So basically all of these sessions coming in, these people say, okay, I want to do something with the ABM. Okay, that's cool. The session manager will find a free session for you, assign that to you, and link it basically to whatever session is on that side. This makes it work, uh, well, we promised a lot more performance, but in the end, you know, the ABM is the ABM, so a piece of code will run as fast as it would run before. Uh, that's, not, that's not improved. So if you expect that to happen, uh, I'm not going to do any promises there. Uh, I'm just saying that I've seen application performance improve, but that's mainly because uh, uh, people also started to rethink the way they deploy their applications. Um, how many people of you are running just one application server broker for your application? Two, three. Is everyone using load balancing? Everyone doing things like failover, high availability? I don't believe it. No. <laughs> anyway, so there was no need, right? Because the thing never went down. That's that's basically what people got used to. But in the end, it's not just for the uh, for the sake of things going down. But we had a lot of performance problems at uh, at my previous employer as well. But uh, that all had to do because we were scaling that application server again uh, only vertically because we didn't know any other way, and otherwise we needed to use something called the nature of load balancer, you all know that one. It's not the prettiest of solutions, uh, but now that they have sort of another solution, because you can use any web, uh, uh, web server load balancer technology nowadays, um, it's become quite easy to say, I'm not going to do one instance, maybe I even have three running on different machines, but it's, you know, that gives me a lot more power basically to being able, especially if you have a high number of requests coming in, depends a little bit on what you're doing, obviously, uh, that basically it mean, makes sense to have a different deployment model, but I'll come back to that. So, developing for Pathos. This is what I call the easy part. I can probably, uh, even without knowing your application, sit together with you for a day and we can have your application running in a test modus uh, uh, with Pathos. I'm pretty confident that I would be able to, to make that work. Obviously, I need a little bit of your expertise because you're the domain expert, but the, 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 the development part is quite easy. Um, obviously, you need to be aware of some things. So all connections are made over HTTPS. Default, you know, the requirements are if you're going to open this to the outside world, it doesn't make sense to do it over HTTP. If it's internal only, it has. Start off with, there's no more app server DC. So if you were using this type of connections, forget about it, throw it away, won't work. It doesn't exist anymore. This was a proprietary protocol that we wrote, um, and it's gone. Because everything needs to be HTTP. Um, what you can do, you can just look up your connect statements, and to be quite honest, especially if you're using a framework, uh, if a framework provider is a smart person, you, can, you only have to do that once somewhere. Uh, if you're unlucky, you have several, but even then, you know, it's a finary place. Uh, making sure that you use this format nowadays. Uh, if you have named maybe a web app, like I said, so you can have the root app. If you deploy it to the root app, you can forget about this, but I would advise against it. I like my sort of isolation levels here. So I would just say, I give it a name, uh, whatever that might be, and then slash, slash HTTP. That's for ABL clients. So ABL clients want to do uh, just a normal app server transport connection. So we have several transports, HTTP, Redis, Web, SOAP. Uh, those are the transport types, and this is for ABL clients. So the session model can be either session managed or session free. Um, 
session three is a is a is a, um, is, 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 is the state free version. So that they, so session managed is really for those people who are still working with bound sessions. So let's say the where or uh, state reset sort of uh, things, stateless. Um, if that session needs to be managed somehow, you need to connect in this mode. So where you would normally connect uh, to a certain broker that was running in a certain mode, and that would define whatever mode that was running in. Um, we're not doing that anymore. We're saying it's running in a sort of single mode, and the client decides in which mode he wants to connect. And there are some things, and it's pretty well documented, if you're doing state reset or state aware, uh, is what you need to be aware of to get the same behavior. It, it's really mimicking. It's not the same. Again, it's not the same. It's mimicking the behavior that we had, but it should still run as it ran before. So clients, uh, easy URL slash show. Um, that's definitely different than before, right? Because uh, it used to be a lot of uh, focus focus, like Redfield as well, by the way, with the uh, with the CGI messenger uh, uh, or the uh, CISA uh, for Windows uh, uh, messengers, those kind of things. REST clients can either uh, use the REST or the web transport. Uh, web transport uh, will be covered. In web handler uh, part, and we'll come back to later to that. Um, and the WebSeed client is also just using the slash web. And obviously, this is just very the, the very basic uh, stuff here. If anyone using open clients? Either Java, Blink, <coughs> then we can forget about this. But you know, we, we introduce sort of the same. You can use the same URL. And you just need to be aware that you need to set the session model to either zero or one for session managed or session free. And uh, Java Open Client obviously has the same where we have the string URL that we can uh, that we can set. Having said that, uh, how about the well I'm not sure if this is the correct question, but yeah. the dynamics client. Dynamics. Oh dynamics. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mean the dynamics framework? Yeah, the good old. There are some there are some caveats there. Yes, uh, I think I think we have that also documented somewhere. So, have you already tried that? No, not yet. No, not yet. No, but I can give you I can give you some pointers. There are some there are some things that you need to be aware of, uh, but it will work. It's 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 a p s p we a p s p a p s we yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, of course, it's it's you know dynamics framework is is just yeah, an ABO yeah. client at, at the end of the day. But there are some attention points that you need to be aware of um, um, in terms of authentication as well. Um, so, and I can't remember from the top of my head, but it's I can I can look it up for you. I, I we did we've done some already, so should be okay. In terms of the. Um, the number one uh, thing where it all goes south, in my experience, is the uh, memory leak. And, and it's, it's those were already in your application. Uh, and like I said, um, and we were doing this as well, uh, basically saying so every 30 minutes or every 60 minutes or every day or every week or whatever uh, schedule we had. We were just trimming the app server because basically the, the agent processes were slowing down over time because they were basically broken with memory leaks, um, which was fine. You know, we just said, oh, we're just going to ignore the fact that we have memory leaks. We're just going to reset, 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 and forget about it. Um, so there is similar, again, not the same, functionality in PESOE nowadays, uh, which you can sort of, oops, it, I, I would advise against it. You know, it's a good time to, to get rid of those memories once and for all. Um, because, and, and why do I say that? Because we also build in uh, quite some stuff that will help you with detecting those leaks. Uh, obviously, you can do that using the dynamic object login, uh, which will result, you know, in logging. And then still, you need to run sort of a procedure over that login file to make sure that you get the right information for yourself. That's just one part of it. But we also did something, and then again we're talking about uh, um, about the REST API again. Uh, Excuse me, Mayor. Yes. Is, is it uh, in 
was in 12 or it goes like 11, 11 7. 11, 7, 4 and onwards. Okay, so that that one. Because yeah, I was this reading. One. No, yeah. the, the down, down part. The, the this one. one. Yeah. Is the lock uh, structure the same in 11, 7 and N No. Uh, the, the so the whole thing is, and I will come back to that later, uh, uh, later this morning or this afternoon, um, is that the logging changed dramatically when you're using a different logger, actually, uh, between 11 and 12. And in 12, you have a lot more options to even decide the format of your workflow. So they won't be the same for everyone. So that makes it also tricky if you, you know, these kind of sample codes that will work for most people. If you do not change anything, it will work. But yeah, if, if someone decided, okay, we're going to put some extra information into the log files, because it's, it's yeah, obviously you can log your own messages, but you can also change the format of everything, uh, which is very interesting, uh, and, and which makes it more suitable to use maybe for your business. Uh, but that's 12, yeah, that's 12 onwards. Uh, so, so the analyzing tool doesn't work with logs from 11.7, even you you have, you can cannot analyze in 12 these logs made by 11.7. I haven't tried. I haven't tried. Okay. But potentially it should still work pretty But it's always, you know, the 11.7, 12 uh, thing is always a little bit more tricky. Um, my advice would be always, you know, it's, it's uh, the thing is that I'm investigating memory leak at the moment. Yeah. And and it, so it, uh, production is runni running 11.7 at the moment. So to find out it's difficult, it's a batch progress. So yeah. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, yeah. that's and why. And, 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 and we, we did have, you know, it's not just your code. We also introduced some memory. It's not just, you know, it's not just you. Uh, uh, programs also had the droppable at some point. Uh, we had some issues, I know, with the, for example, the data object handler, which is uh, leaking by itself, which is already fixed now, but there were some uh, memory leaks also introduced over time. Um, there's also things called OEJMX, uh, and I'll come back to that in a bit, um, which is also interesting. So the SOAP part, anyone using SOAP services? Already? No, 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 no. no. All REST? There's still a lot of SOAP in the, in the Benelux, at least, uh, for business to business, I should say. But anyway, so, um, this is all if you're if you're using the proxy generator right now uh, in 11 or for classic app server and so uh, you can still use it uh, for Pezzui uh, just be aware is that the rest so you need to enter this information and the rest will be ignored anyway uh, why is that because you needed to do something like a URL that you needed to handle but it doesn't make any sense anymore because that was meant for the web service adapter URL which was a separate Tomcat uh, instance running your little uh, applet in there, uh, which would help you basically in eventually connect it to the application server, but as it is a web server, it's all deployed on that application server, so it doesn't need a URL anymore because it's referring to itself. Uh, and these are the, uh, uh, the other things you do need to set. But then the most important part, I would say, um, yeah, is, is deploying uh, Pezzoe or deploying for Pezzoe. Yeah, it's what I call the automated part, and, and oh, and by the way, it's time to rethink your uh, security part. Um, so I just wrote some general questions, sort of, uh, that you should ask yourself when you decide on your deployment model. So, uh, so how many app server brokers are you running? So there's the question why I was asking that just now, currently to support your production environment. And how does that translate to the number of Pezzoe instances? use name server load balancing currently? Shouldn't you start using uh, load balancing? Do I want to use VMs or start using something like Docker containers? Um, how do I deploy my application currently? Am I using an installer based one, automated pipelines, manually, all those kind of things? Uh, and which APL applications could slash should be bundled logically based on shared database connections, profiles, and the security model? So all of these questions will lead you to a target architecture or target infrastructure or whatever you want to call it. Let's call it an infrastructure architecture. Um, and and then basically that decides 
what you're going to do and what you need to do to make this uh, deployable to your target environment. Um, any preferences here in the audience? VMs, Docker? Most people still use VMs because they're used to using VMs. Uh, obviously, Docker will create a, a little bit of a knowledge gap before you get uh, before you get it running, but it has a lot of obvious advantages uh, uh, by using Docker. Um, and, and, and then I'm really talking about things like uh, uh, application upgrades, those kind of things. Uh, in a Dockerized world, or Kubernetes even, uh, com combined with Docker, it's so easy basically to do your application upgrades from that point and say, okay, I'm just going to fade out all of these all the containers, which contain all of my old stuff, and that's going to be taken over by all of these containers with new stuff in them. So it's uh, uh, easy peasy, but these are some of the questions that you need to ask yourself. Then, we did have this uh, one, fat, one size fits none, uh, um, as I call them, uh, one size fits none solution uh, uh, where we introduced a path prop com utility, uh, which is still very useful. So it basically says, okay, put in your old view broker property file, and I'll create something similar for you in a Pesary configuration file. So basically, it will make a sort of tailored OpenHSOP properties for you. Uh, and a very basic one to one configuration for you to be created Pesary instance. So you still need to create your Pesary instance, and then you can put those uh, configurations in there, basically. Um, it's very useful for those who put certain properties like propass, database connection, starter parameters, starter procedures, etc. Right? So you have those now, so you can just pick your whatever, what, what you have in production, you put that to the tool, and it will give you some idea about how should I configure my Pesary instance. And then, you know, start deploying the actual applications to them, etc. And you also try to set up a similar configuration in terms of min and max sessions agents, uh, but reality shows that a one size fits all approach does not work. Um, and that, I think that's because every concurrent session needed to be handled by a separate agent, which was an operating system process in the flat capture. While the, the multi session agent is now capable of handling hundreds of those applications, potentially hundreds. Um, so it's, it's all about testing, testing, testing. There's this whole white paper that we have on, on, on tuning the performance. Uh, so it's very important that you uh, uh, try this in an early stage. And I will come back to that later as well in the not so successful story uh, of, of one of our uh, partners actually, uh, who shall not be named obviously, but uh, they tested too late when it was already too late, so to say. So let's look at that scenario. So say if I have, uh, for, for the sake of argument, um, I have a REST broker, if I'm in state free. I have an ATSP, which is either a common status or state aware, or one of the other ones. And uh, we have also a SOAP, which is state free. Uh, the application server, the ATSP transport is connected both database A and both database B, and the rest of the SOAP interfaces are only connected to this one. This is not so unrealistic. Maybe the APSP also has this uh, repository database, you know, for the GUI, those kind of things. So, um, so, so in this case, just, you know, without knowing anything about numbers or anything, what would be the preferred setup be of, of whatever instance or instances? Are you going to run one, run one instance, uh, maybe two? Say they have all the same profile. Anyone? Any takers? So, um, again, uh, and this will always, it depends, it really depends. Uh, it also depends on whether you are running things like containers or running on VMs. The only thing that you should need to be aware of is that obviously it makes a lot of sense to bundle something. Uh, why? Because otherwise you'll be running sort of like you were running before without having the advantages of basically 
combining resources uh, and utilizing resources for the same purpose uh, in the air, which you can do because if they are using, let's say, the same, uh, so at least the same as that we stow and rest, those are actually the same, right? I don't care about the, 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 the session model because that's not relevant anymore, but they're using the same profile, same database connection. So they should be probably bundled, could be bundled under one ABL web app. That's a possibility. Uh, then maybe you have a separate uh, uh, ABL, uh, um, ABL app uh, for your HTSC traffic, because that has different database connections. Um, but you should always also be aware is that um, what happens if I need to update one of these? So like I said, in a containerized world, it's very easy because then you throw the whole container away and put something else in place. But if you're using a VM and you just want to update your instance, you need to be aware of what the implications are for whatever changes you are doing um, to, the, uh, to the application. And if you can deploy those web applications, uh, new updated web applications, while it's running, while it needs updating, does it need refreshing of the R code, you know, all those kind of things. So it's a lot of things to at least be aware of and think about before you decide even to bundle them all together, because that could be very good for resource usage, but not so good for upgrades or, or analyzing what's failing. So if I bundle this all together in one instance and it's not performing, then I really need some expert knowledge to find out is this, this, is this or this causing my performance problem. Uh, because they, at, the, at the end, they all end up in the same bucket from a logging perspective, uh, you'll see everything basically in one big logging, and you need to find out yourself, and yes, with the, with the logging format, you can at least say, I want to put in transport, uh, whatever, uh, so if it's coming from web, I can see that it's coming from web, if it's coming from the REST transport, I can see it, I can see it if it's coming from the APSV transport, those kind of things, so it, it could make it more difficult to analyze where your performance problem lies, so if you have two, three instances, then you'll see one of those instances not performing so well, so then you know, okay, this is called by either REST or so, or whatever. So, again, a lot of stuff to think about. Uh, yeah, and then you have deployment methods. So, obviously, there's the, these two. I already uh, saw these ones. But there's also deployment methods within the instance. So, you're going to deploy your ABL application or ABL web application, uh, and there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, you could even say, I'm just going to zip my instance where I'm sure that it's okay. I'm going to copy that, throw it into my production environment, and say I'm going to register it to that OpenEdge installation. That's something like pathman register, and then you basically say I'm going to re register that instance in that directory, and register that, uh, that with the OpenEdge application, and then start the instance. That should probably work as well. Uh, deploy new R code only, uh, and that is, that is obviously if you already have your ABL web, web application deployed, um, and you only have changed your R code, then you basically can just deploy your new R code and it will work. So that's cool. If you do not have deployed your web application, obviously you first need to deploy our OE ABL web oeabl.war, which is our uh, basic web app, and then you can deploy your own uh, uh, configurations on top of that. But we also introduced something in 12.2 and onwards, which is called the Open Edge Application Archive. And that basically says, okay, I'm just gonna export uh, a or. So you can either do two things. You can export your ABL application for your instance by doing ccman export or pressman export, that will give you this .oeAR file, which you can then in turn import in another instance, which is very useful if you want to do it. If you want to set up a new environment and you already have a running environment, you're just saying export and I'll import it in new one, which is cool. But obviously there's a situation where you don't have that one yet, and then we obviously have uh, uh, in, in the um, Open Edge DevOps framework, as we call it nowadays. So this is the Gradle, uh, the Gradle uh, script that we have for CI/CD pipelines. There's also uh, one for creating the Open Edge application archive. So 
because that basically means I'm going to tailor, I'm going to uh, uh, pick whatever you have in your source control, and from that I'm going to create that OEAR file, and that you can import uh, into your uh, special instance that you've created. I think the the main thing here is is that what I've learned is that everything is scriptable uh, compared to the classic like everything. Uh, you can do security properties nowadays with a tool called SecProp, which is a CLI. You have, for all of your other properties in the uh, Apache instances, you can use OEProp. Um, you have something also called, uh, uh, yeah, with OEProp, that's, that's, that's pretty funny. So you can basically say, okay, I'm going to use OEProp commands to set every single property that I want different from the default. I'm just going to put them down. Or you could say, I already have a file with properties, which, and then I only take the delta, which is different. So I maybe have then an OpenXL properties file of four lines. And then I'm, I'm just doing a, uh, a file import uh, with the, uh, with the passman, uh, sorry, the OEProp command. I can just say OEProp dash F and I could put in a merge file that I want to have merged with my OpenX properties file. So there's a lot of scripting and, and because everything can be scripted, everything can be automated and everything can be easily pushed into things like containers. Because you want to do the same thing every single time and you do want to do the same thing on every single machine. And that's the whole promise of using containers is that I give, if I give you those containers right now that I have running on my laptop, is that you should be able to start them and that they should always work. Um, yeah, in terms of security. So what are you doing today? So are you already using client principle? I think Google Dynamics is using client principle, I think. No? No, that's too new. <laughs> Maybe that's one of the changes. Yes, exactly. Um, is there a need? But anyone else already using client principle? I think yeah, DJR probably is using client principle. Uh, if you're already using it for like production. Uh, but yeah, how many times do you not get the question? Is there a need for integration with an Active Directory, for example? We've had that question like so many times uh, in the past. And, and and what you need to do at a certain point is leverage whatever we build in there. You know, we've got the Spring Security Framework in there, and obviously we tailored that because by itself, it will give you some Spring token, which you cannot use within the context of an open access creation. But what we do, basically, whatever authentication method you're using there, we're saying, okay, Spring will come up with, if everything's done correctly, obviously, and then it's authenticated, it will give us the Spring token, and we will already convert that into a client principle token which, of course, you can use within the context of an open edge application because it's, it's readable and it's, and, and, and it's approachable uh, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, one more thing that I forgot to mention, which is not, not unimportant. Um, step back, so uh, if you're doing stuff now on the, let's say, uh, agent level. So if you're using things like startup procedures or um, uh, session startup procedures or, or agent startup procedures, those kind of things, if you want to use them uh, with the, the, you can, but you need to be aware where you place them. What is the context? What do you want to happen with that procedure? When, when does it need to run? Because the concept of the multi-session agent is a little bit different because basically uh, a lot of people, a lot of clients can end up using the same agent, but obviously they're using their own session, but all of those sessions are all handled by the same multi-session agent. In the past, agent and session were one. So that was a little bit easier. So nowadays you have agent startup procedures, session startup procedures, session connect procedures, etc., etc., etc. So you need to decide which level do I want to do that? So I can imagine, for example, that if you want to have your uh, uh, multi-session agent uh, do something, so for all sessions, then you would put it in the agent startup procedure called activate user. Uh, and 
if you only want to do it for the session, so stuff like I want to, uh, 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 for example, uh, check whatever bind principle I'm receiving, then you would put that in your session activate procedure. So every time someone wants to start a session, that's what you start out with saying, okay, so what's the client principle object? So what's in there? Okay, fine. Do whatever you want with it. And then only start doing whatever they requested uh, uh, to start doing. The web speed part, anyone using web speed? Yeah, I already know Matthew asked me a question about web speed. So uh, there's at least one one person. Yes, I'm not using web speed. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I'm uh, helping to move from classic up. So okay, that's yeah, good. Um, so for most web speed applications, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to where you could basically just define, well, basically sort of say, refer to database fields even uh, from, 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 uh, from web speed. Uh, HTML, web, map, HTML, map object, or map web object, yeah. Um, but we're fixing that uh, to work anyway uh, in uh, 12, seven, which is to be released soonish. Um, but we did a quite straightforward migration. Uh, there's, there's even steps that are defined in the, in the KB article, and uh, as Ma Matthew already uh, told me, uh, there's always you know, these, these exceptions or things you need to be aware of. <coughs> but um, in basic, it's, it's quite fine. We, we created something called a compatibility web handler. Um, and I said I leave it to Mike to explain the web handlers, but in general, uh, uh, a web handler is nothing else than mapping, let's say, URL operations, and that's your traditional get, post, delete, uh, those kind of things, HTTP actions, mapping those to ABL code. Um, so that, that's pretty cool. Uh, obviously, if you're talking about compatibility web handler, that needs to act like it is a web speed application, so there's only the get and the delete. Uh, operations are supported from the top of my head. Um, but with the other web handlers, you can basically override every single thing that happens when someone approaches an endpoint, a URL endpoint, with a with an either get, post, update, whatever. You can override whatever functionality is behind that, and you could yeah, you can put your own ABL code in there uh, or run even older ABL code from that web handler. So it makes it very easy, and that's actually exactly sort of what the, what the, what the compatibility web handler does. It just says, okay, so whenever I get a get action or a delete action, I need to do something else, uh, for, which is web speed related. And there are some things here. So uh, as you can see the caveats, there are always caveats. So if you have changed things like the web disk.p, uh, you need to use the custom web handler, and there's a thing called source web object web handler.p, so that is where you would need to make those changes uh, going forward, so instead of that old path. If you have any, made any changes to webutil.p, you need to make them again, but in the newer version of uh, webutil.p, um, just for running in most of the because obviously it's running a different type of agent, uh, which has its implications. The map web object. There is, uh, uh, there was no migration path. Basically, we said we won't support that anymore. Uh, and then several larger customers and partners came to progress and said, "Well, then we're not moving to OpenH12." And that's how it's played nowadays, obviously. And I would do the same if I was if I was them. Uh, and if that's enough people, and, and if they're large enough accounts, then at some point, you know, product management will pull down on his knees again. Okay, 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 we're going to implement something. Uh, also has to do with the fact is that I think the, the experience and the, uh, the, the knowledge level uh, wasn't high enough at the time to be 
knowledgeable enough about what we needed to change to support it. And now we found at least a way of moving these applications forward in a relatively easy way. Uh, that is uh, obviously based on the customer feedback idea. I can't re remember, uh, well, I can't really, uh, I need to be uh, expressed, express, expressing this every single time. Uh, this came from an idea. People voted on, people commented on it, and from that basically uh, it came to, uh, it, there's already some binaries available in the early software access program, which obviously is part of the customer validation program, uh, and then you can uh, probably t already test it uh, if that works for you. You could also work for 12.7, wait for 12.7, but if it's not working for you, then maybe you're too late already. So you can skip uh, is there any workaround because uh, Customer is having AIC, AI, AIX, and mm -hmm. the last version supported long term, it's 12.2. Yeah. So, is there a workaround if, if this is needed? Is there any workaround? No. Okay. No. Okay. No, that's good, a, good that's a simple answer. Um, and th that is the only answer, really, yeah. because uh, yeah, we're not porting those things back. Okay. Uh, so, th and there is no workaround. Okay. 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 Well, uh, again, if that's no. if they need it, if they, they really would require it, this would be. But the I, way. I, at the moment, I think I don't know that. But it's a uh, it's developed with, with a different developers with a long time. So maybe we find that some somewhere it was used. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's. It would start with an idea again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, a, a every time, you know, uh, I, I come to product man management, and first we have a lot of discussions saying, okay, should we or should we not? And but when they explain to me why they did or why they didn't do certain stuff. But then in the end, it will end up with, you know, just create an idea anyway, because we need to track it, because it could be just your one customer, mm -hmm. but it could still be more. Yeah. And I've heard more complaints about. Our plans to get rid of AIX. Uh, I've heard had many enthusiastic reactions by some of the customers who were saying, "Now I finally have an argument within the organization to get rid of them." Uh, and the other way around, saying, "But it has been running for 20 plus years, fantastically, and now we suddenly need to change to something new, which we don't know, etc., etc., etc." So it's can, it can work both ways, but. I don't see it happening is that we go back to AIX, but you can always, you know, we should at least register it. We need to be aware how many customers are actually requesting that. Um, so a little bit about administration and monitoring, so this is this is where, the, if you ask me, this is the tricky new part, and this is also the most important part uh, if you're going to run anything in production, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, where you need to be you need to have things in place before you start doing that, so to say. So I already mentioned uh, some of it. So these are very familiar to most of you, and obviously operational program management. So these were sort of the classic ways to, to administer and to, uh, uh, to create, uh, to stop, start, etc. The old the old stuff, uh, pretty classic actually. So as, as you can see, we have quite some new options. And it might be even confusing that you have so many options, but I can I can probably walk you through it, and it's not that difficult. So, PC Man obviously is the Tomcat manager. So this is your sort of the basic. It's a CLI. You can use that as command. It contains everything that you probably need, but it also needs to be executed from the context of the instance. So you need to go into the instance. There's the bin folder. There's the TC Man script, and there you can call. You can't call it from outside of the instant basically. So that's why we've got the Passman. And with Passman, you have the option to also uh, provide a dash uh, capital I, uh, so for instance name. Uh, and, and with that, basically, you refer to one of your instances running on that machine or virtual machine or container. It doesn't really matter. But Passman uh, would be my best practice if, I were, uh, if you were asking. So that's the one. Uh, I think overall they have, 
the same functionality, well, they should have the same functionality anyway. Maybe if you forgot to implement something with Tishimana for read, maybe you did something for Fastman or the other way around, not sure. Uh, but it should be sort of similar. Uh, Fastman has nowadays already also uh, Fastman has a restart, for example, so that automatically uh, shuts down your instance when it's already running, then restarts the instance, etc. those kind of things. So we thought of that instead of having to do a stop first yourself and a start yourself, you can basically just say has a restart and it will do that sort of task for you. Skip, is there also in uh, progress Explorer, this option to restart, or is it do you have to stop? I think it's stop start only. Yeah, yeah, yeah I that's think what so. I thought. Yeah. yeah. Um, could be that with command center it could be possible, but I'm not not convinced yet. But anyway, so you, for, for the larger part, uh, you still have OpenS Explorer slash OpenS Management where you can administer, uh, uh, administer the thing. Obviously, that's all GUI-based, uh, so that's still useful. You know, if you're an administrator, you want to just look at the system and see whatever sessions it's running in a, in an, in a visual way. Uh, that's definitely your way to go. <coughs> if you decide and say, okay, so I'm not that big a fan of open, open Edge Explorer management, but I do want to be able to maybe visualize some stuff uh, myself. Maybe I create my own interface for it. That's where the REST API comes in as well. So. Yes, you can just use, for example, Postman uh, uh, to, to do that and just say, okay, I want to see which agents are active and I want to see for that agent what sessions are active and for that session I want to see what procedure is running, for example. So you can really dive into that level by doing some, well, you have to do uh, uh, following calls, so you need to first know which agents are running then you can only see, then you get some agent IDs, and from those agent IDs you can say, okay, and then I'm going to into the session level, and from the session level I can get all sorts of information about memory usage, the dot D, whatever uh, it is that you're using at that moment. So that's that's another option. And then you have uh, JMX, so it is again the REST API that I'm saying here, that is the OE manager but more obviously, uh, the GPU uh, You don't can deploy it into production as well. Uh, make sure, obviously, that you change the default username and password, which are Tomcat Tomcat. But that's sort of the uh, basis that I want to say anyway. Is 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 whenever you're going to deploy for production, that is the first thing you need to be aware of. Is that all of these things, the, the, the default applications that we deploy, also have default username and passwords. If you don't change them, it's like deploying Tomcat. Uh, which still happens a lot uh, in uh, out there, and, 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 and every now and then I encounter a, 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 a Tomcat server, public Tomcat server, which is still Tomcat secret. Uh, and it, it really still happens, and, and that's you know you can't get away with that anymore. Uh, and then there's the newest tool uh, tool in the shed, uh, which is the OpenS command center. Uh, I think with 12.5, 12 12.6 12 ish. Open telemetry is a sort of an, 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 a standard, an open standard for uh, application uh, tracing, logging, and metrics, uh, which will uh, and we we implemented this and I think we did it right now for the metrics and we're working on the tracing part. Uh, but it basically means OpenS Command Center is a is a is a server uh, and a server agent based concept. So what you do. You install one instance of the OpenS Command Center, which is the server install, and then basically you have agents installed on all of your machines where you have OpenS components running, like that. Uh, and the database, by the way, for the open telemetry part of it. And then basically what it does, it has an open telemetry collector, and that collector basically collects all of the information that we need, and we expose that uh, again towards a third party solution, uh, which is doing application application performance monitoring. And then you're going to say, but I had everything sorted. Uh, well, yeah, you probably did. Uh, it's totally different uh, and more advanced. So depending on what you were tracking with the classic app server or web feed, you could keep that information as a reference and see whether you can get sort of the same information from your machine. But like I already said, it also is a little bit different. So even if you would do that, it will you know, are these results really comparable or are they not? So 
So back to the drawing board. Time to rebuild. Uh, so if you were heavily relying on logging functionality, for example, to monitor your environment, like I said, the logging has greatly improved. And uh, format of log file messages can be defined by you. Uh, with, and we also introduced a concept called unified logging and a concept called deferred logging. But I will come back to that uh, later. <sighs> Boring, but necessary part. Um, as you might not know, and maybe this is not your role within the company, but it is important to be aware of, because otherwise you won't get your licenses, uh, or you cho choose the wrong licensing model. Um, obviously, there's an uplift, right, uh, between Classic Capture and Pesri, so I think in terms of named users, it's like 30 euros that's more expensive or something. Uh, you still have your trading <laughs> value, but if you had uh, Classic Capture uh, uh, licenses, uh, and if they're still trading value, you can use the trading value to purchase the Pesri license. Uh, obviously, for uh, if you're having SaaS contracts, those kind of things, other rules apply, but in, in general, if you're using traditional licenses, there are also two different licenses available for the application servers, because we have a production license and we have a development license. And it says production, but we found out at some point that if you're trying to test in a serious test environment and you're using this one, yeah, it can only handle five concurrent sessions, but that doesn't make any sense. You know, how how can you test, especially on acceptance environments, you know, this is not this is not a real life scenario. So you need to have a sort of an unlimited one that is at least capable of running unlimited. Um, and if the instance needs to run dot piece, uh, which is obviously not the best practice in production. Um, make sure to install a development license next to the Pesri for production license. Uh, so that is the way of, of working around this, because I know that with the application server, uh, the classic application server, it was possible uh, and setting it as an option, and here you really need to install a development license next to it if you still want to run uncompiled code. The, the, the price increase, um, this one as well. So who has access agent licenses right now? Come on. My customer. Uh, yeah, exactly. So that's the, that's, the, 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 the headache file that I call that. Because uh, someone decided within progress is that um, the access agent licensing model for Pesui is out in open as well. Um, yeah, you can argue uh, whether that is a good decision or not, but it's a fact, and, and it has to do with the fact is that you can imagine is that it, it very much uh, lends itself very well for the classic app server because one agent is one session. So if you would buy five access agent licenses, you could run up to five agents, which meant five concurrent sessions. Period. But now we have this thing, which is an opposition agent. So in theory, you could have one MS agent running hundreds of sessions. So how do we limit that license model? But then, you know, I think that's just me. I think there's a difference between that and a commercial model. But uh, there are also no more concurrent user licenses. It means is that at least for the for the Pesui one, they need to switch to a different model. And I guess it's not quite the way. Easy peasy. I wish it was. <laughs> because uh, the the problem with uh, concurrent usage is that uh, the nature of concurrent usage is that we didn't really care where it came from. We just said you have you can have so many concurrent connections. And that's it. That's what you license for. And whether these were internal users or external users, there was no real divide. So there was already the thing, the exit agent license was actually created for external usage only. Uh, and incidental use. So every now and then that you use the application. Uh, and it's, 
I'm not saying it makes sense, but I'm just, you know, I'm just telling you this because this is this is definitely something. It's going to cost time to get in, you know, the right things in place, and you don't want you guys to be finished with everything and then end up in a point where we can't deploy it anywhere because we don't have the correct licenses to, 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 to deploy it. So that's why I really thought it, it needed to be mentioned is that in, in an early stage, you know, if you know we're on a concurrent user licensing model, for your database, that's still fine, but for the application server, it, it's no longer fine. So we'll need to go, and that that's, you either need to go to name user licensing, which is sort of the preferred way, but that can have obviously uh, uh, price uh, 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 pricing consequences uh, because a name user is uh, you are a name user and I'm a name user. So probably with all of the concurrent users within your company, maybe you will now have 200 concurrent users, but potentially that represents thousand or two thousand at least, which are all name users who are using the application. Depending on how you define the concurrency, the amount of concurrent users. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, but it's, you know, it's obviously this is not my choice, but it needs to be explained anyway. So you'll need to go to a name license, so that, that's the alternative for concurrency user license, or there are two alternative concurrency models available where we can choose between a core license and a feathery license. Um, okay, and now comes the interesting part, so feathery life, it has some caveats, be aware. Because obviously, this is cheaper than that. So it's actually light, but it's it's limited. So what we said, uh, actually light can run up to five sessions concurrently. It's also limited to one ABL application. Then again, you're saying oh, I don't care, but it is important because we do have a lot of customers who now have one. Uh, the, the, they had access agent license. Actually, they were running three different brokers, for example, with these three different ABL applications on them, all covered by their access agent license. But the Pesoe license can only run one ABL. Uh, so that means if you want to translate that into that, and you have three, let's say, three different ABL apps from that context, then you need at least three Pesoe licenses. And then you can't even load balance anything, because then you have the three different instances, and you still need maybe to double everything just for uh, uh, just for availability purposes and say, okay, so then I need two of these for each to support my current application, which then in turn makes this far more expensive than it was here. So there's there's things to think about. We can, you know, we, we always find a solution for this. That's my message. Uh, we're always happy to think along, you know, we, we need to Sort of fit within the within the context that uh, the product management uh, uh, and, and legal uh, together uh, came up with, uh, but in the end, um, I think for for uh, especially for partners, uh, if you're already on a percentage of application or a SaaS contract, you know this isn't even an issue. We need, don't need to talk about this stuff. Uh, but if you're just doing normal licensing or the, the, the standard licensing as we used to do them, just buying licensing upfront, etc., and then maintenance, then that all of this comes in. And, and I'm not too big a fan of core licensing, but sometimes, you know, there's just no other. Can, can you explain what does it mean, core licensing, or how? <coughs> uh, is it by user, or what? No. no. no it's, it's, it's basically, we're saying, so if you buy two core licenses from us, basically that means you can uh, run up to two cores on one machine to support your application. And that can be either the database, can be either the application server. Uh, doesn't really matter, but it's a machine yeah. license. So it's, it's, it's you can only so if you have let's say two machines or three machines or four machines, five machines, you need to license all of those machines separately. And, and obviously we can do virtual cores. You know we don't doesn't need to be physical core because that's impossible. That's what Oracle said at some point. You need to. Yeah, you need to license all of your physical cores, but nowadays, yeah, what, what's a physical core? Because especially when you go to cloud, then it's impossible because you're running on physically thousands, hundreds, yeah, yeah, millions so of cores so at the same what, time. What is the price for a core? I don't know. I'm not a salesman. 
<laughs> like, yeah. I, I, I can look it up, but it's. Uh, but I think I think we did some things. So if you're moving from access agent and you're considering core, uh, um, but, but how can people think? Uh, what are the options if they don't know any any? No, uh, that, that's why I said so. Just talk to the account manager, and 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 they can come up with whatever pricing uh, they want to. Uh, obviously, we have priced this. Yeah, but uh, I think. I can look it up. I'll okay. look it up later. I, I have access to it, obviously, but I don't know, don't know it from the top of my head because I don't want yeah. to do. I, this is not what I like to do. Yeah, I know. I, know. I really don't. But this is, this is what <laughs> I, I end up in yeah. sometimes yeah. in discussions for people because this is the number two blocker. Number one is Pesari. Number two is this licensing story that we again have to go to discuss. And some, some people just two years ago bought access agents for 11.7. And now they're going to 12, and now we're telling them, oh, those are not valid anymore, so we need to come up with something else. Like I said, it's a headache funnel, so for me as well. Having said that, we also have a success story. <laughs> How would you define the user? Because if there is a, a stable computer and you see oh, something you see yeah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, and that's you a good have something in your, your cell phone and maybe a tablet, and you do exactly the same, the same person. Yeah, exactly. So that's a, that's a cool thing. So that's also why a named user, so we basically have a, I didn't know that we end up in this discussion, but it's good. So <laughs> we have a named user and we have something called a registered client, a registered device. So based on your needs, you can't mix those. You have to, you have to basically decide either one of those models which works best. So what is a registered device that basically says, okay, we're not going to you look at the named user, so the user that's actually using the application, but we're using and uh, looking at the devices that are using the application. So for example, if you're working uh, or you're deploying your application in a factory, uh, there might be five terminals which are used by 250 people. But then it's obviously it's cheaper to register the terminal that everyone is using because they're working in team shifts or whatever than to do the named users. But your scenario is also a good one. What if I'm one named user and I have 60 devices that I do uh, connect to the application with? Then it's obviously cheaper to license the named user because then it's just you and it doesn't matter how many times you connect to the application from what device or whatever. We're just saying, no, you're the named user, so you're licensed and I don't care what you do with the application, it's yours, you know? That's and usually you have the fact <coughs> There's also an office. Yeah, that's true. So you need to, at, at that point, you need to come up with, still, uh, uh, you can ask them basically saying, okay, so how many people do you have who are going to work with the application? Uh, and I expect that you probably know because every user is probably known within the context of the application itself as well. Not always, but it should be I guess. There is coffee. Yeah. Uh, of course, you continue. You <coughs> feel something up there. Yeah, I can, I can tell. Uh, at it. this moment, very many yeah. thanks to Ruben. Uh, uh, one of my comments. Mm -hmm. I'm very sorry that uh, there are not in the audience uh, customers who heavily rely on that speed or upsell and are not listening. Okay. Just a few more minutes of your time. Um, just discussing uh, the, the success story and the not so successful story, uh, which also needs to be told. Um, just just quickly, uh, what did Exact have before they actually uh, moved everything over? They have an open edge web client application, which is all in the OGUI, obviously. They do not do anything at the time with uh, uh, infratistics or something, just plain old ADO GUI. Uh, and they have also a web speed application. Uh, it's fully web UI. It's actually, you know, the web speed application always sounds old, but you can make them look as, as good as you want to make them look because they have very smart. Uh, very smart guy uh, working uh, from the web front end side of things. Uh, and they basically what they do with web speed is what a lot of people are doing, they just generate in JSON. Uh, and then 
whatever front uh, front end framework you have for generating screens on top of it. Okay. Uh, they also have SOAP API, and they are only distri distributing DLs, but they also have pro uh, procedural libraries, which is also a best practice, by the way. But having said that, uh, some manual operations required after installation to get the web UI up and running uh, for a web server setup, IIS, and the whole the whole shebang because that wouldn't run out of the box, right? It's always a little bit tricky to get web applications uh, running on web speed running uh, out of the box. And their takeaway is basically when they did this is that they said, okay, we need to adjust our installer. So what are we going to deliver uh, actually? And it's funny because the only thing they install nowadays is just a directory which looks a lot similar to just a Tesoe instance like you get out of the box, but then they filled it with everything they need for themselves and everything is scripted obviously, right? Uh, like I said, um, so from the installer they create a Tesoe instance, they then, you know, they have their, their instance directories wherever you install their application. Uh, you can do that obviously on Tesoe <coughs> VMs if you want to install the same thing on different instances. Um, <coughs> they use the web handlers they never did REC, for the obvious reason, uh, they do a lot of uh, uh, things with uh, code generation, they had a full-fledged SOAP API which was able to uh, uh, do everything with every application entity within their uh, within their application, so basically whether that's a general ledger account or a debtor or whatever, everything was covered by the SOAP API, so you, so you can do anything, but from that to go into our old REST API creation methods, and that's like mapping, for example, which is impossible, and then you had the other things, which were all sort of prescriptive, and they didn't really like that because they want to do everything in a generic way. So that's why they use the web handler basically, and they only needed to, it's just a service interface that they created, and then they mapped it basically almost to the procedures that the SOAP API was already using as well. So it made them very easy to have a full-fledged REST API. So now people have the option whether they want to install the REST API, SOAP API, or both. And they are all running it on the same instance, together with the uh, uh, web speed and together with the uh, uh, web client if you could choose to install that as well. Uh, and the cool thing is now is that I'm actually being approached by implementation partners from Exact is, oh, now that they have adopted that, uh, we want to look at adopting a container strategy for implementing that solution at customer side. So they are working <coughs> on the Docker deployment. And obviously the customer not such a success story, shame. Uh, they who shall not be named or shamed, uh, because it's not important who it was, but it was very painful lessons. Um, the first one I already mentioned, uh, don't don't just treat Pezzoe as being a newer version of the classic app server, it's not. It's just not the same. It will behave differently in different situations. Uh, Performance testing is something you do before moving everything to production. This is, I've seen this time and time again, and I've s I'm saying it upfront every single time, saying, okay, so if you have an acceptance or a test environment, you, you should do some performance testing, and performance testing is not, you know, <coughs> most of the people still are, yeah, but everything still works, and they're just clicking with two users, yeah, everything still works, and then suddenly 500 users start using the application and everything goes. Uh, this is also <coughs> a nice one. So some people thought, "Oh, I really like the uh, the, 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 the new uh, uh, the new variable assignment uh, in, in 12.4." So let's adopt the non-LTS version in production in a SaaS environment uh, where they were coming from a non-SaaS environment. So they combined several customers on the same infrastructure, etc. They did everything together, and then at some point they said, "Hey, there's a bug in 12.4." Uh, okay, sure, we fix it in 12.5. Yeah, we can't upgrade. No, we, we only can upgrade uh, in half a year. Yeah, that's not going to work, you know. That's So be aware, uh, if you don't have a sort of a push of the button, click uh, uh, thing to deploy and upgrade your environment, don't even bother adopting an unknown uh, version. And you can't do decent performance or testing at all without having proper monitoring set up. So a lot of people, they were basically saying, oh, the performance went down. And we're saying, okay, so what's going on? Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. So <coughs> You know, it's the other way around. Make sure you have your monitoring, your logging, etc. You have that all in place so that if you see some migration, you can actually explain it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the new monitoring tools uh, and the open telemetry. Yeah. Is, so 
Those are free of charge. Yeah, yeah it's uh, open as command code. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's uh, free to use. Uh, it's sort of a replacement for the OpenEdge Explorer, which is also uh, free of charge, but um, instead of OpenEdge Management, actually, but that's that is not free of charge, but the OpenEdge Command Center is, and so is the Open Telemetry part, yeah. But there are difference between 11, 7, and 12 about the logging, but where there are other. Oh yeah, but also the, the OpenEdge Command Center won't work with 11.7 uh, instances. So you need to have at least a 12.0 instance of PESOE to be able to monitor it. That's the, that's the caveat there, yeah. Um, obviously we're going to do a lot more stuff there. Um, yeah, that, that's it from me. I uh, hope it was a, learn, a learnable exercise. And uh, it's up to uh, Robert now, I think.